Hi, everybody. Welcome to our session today. Good afternoon. Good morning for some of these you joining online or good evening. Um, so today we're going to be talking about uncovering the value of WASH research through partnership and showcasing the USAID programs that are going on. So I'm going to just run through a quick overview of the session. So a couple housekeeping items. Um, the session will be recorded. For our online audience, please introduce yourself, your name, organization, country in the chat and put your questions in the chat box and participate in our polls. And we have a great um, lineup of speakers and panelists today, really excited about the, the team that we have here. Um, and so our agenda for the day is we're going to first start with um, an introduction from Jeff Goldberg, and then we're going to go into an example of research partnerships, um, and then go through presentations on the different USAID mechanisms have some breakout group discussions on specific topics, and then have our closing. So with that, I would like to welcome Jeff Goldberg to introduce the session. And Jeff is the director of the Center for Water at USAID. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, and really glad to be with you all uh, here in the room uh, and those online as well. Uh, as Rachel mentioned, I'm Jeff Goldberg. I'm the director of USAID Center for Water Security, Sanitation, and Hygiene. Uh, I'm really thrilled uh, to be here for this session, uh, which will feature our work under our uh, brand new Water for the World uh, implementation research agenda. Um, so as some of you may know uh, and others may not, USAID released the Implementation Research Agenda, uh, which complements our agency plan under our whole of government US global water strategy at the height of COVID-19. So we didn't formally get to have uh, a launch event for it, uh, but all the better, uh, we're a year into it now. Uh, so instead of just launching it, we can talk about some of the work uh, that's going on under it. Um, and just a little bit of history, the developing the research agenda was a multi-year process for us and it's really gratifying to be doing this here at World Water Week, because uh, in fact, the last World Water Week that was in person in 2019, uh, we held some donor consultations with other donor counterparts uh, to make sure that uh, any investments that we make in research are complementary to what's going on in the sector as a whole. And then later that fall, we held a public consultation uh, at the UNC Water and Health Conference that uh, many of you here uh, in person, and I'm sure online, uh, fed into. Um, so you know, this is really, uh, you know, in that same vein of the consultations that we went through during the development of this agenda, this is intended not just to be a tool for USAID, but really to uh, be a vehicle to promote sector-wide collaboration to enhance the effectiveness uh, and maximize the impact of the investments of the sector overall. Um, so just a few more words on the, the scope of the research agenda uh, to that point and put a finer, a little bit of a finer point on that. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, with taxpayer dollars, we really view our role centrally uh, at headquarters at USAID to make sure that we remain at the tip of the spear uh, and that we are investing in approaches uh, and implementation modalities that we know will get the biggest value for money uh, and maximize, uh, as I said, the, the impact that we're all seeking. So. To that end, uh, through these consultations, we identified a series of priority gaps uh, in uh, knowledge of approaches, uh, and that's a key point. It's about approaches here. We're not questioning the overall intrinsic value of water and sanitation. We took as a core premise uh, that we're trying to really hone in on the implementation modalities. Uh, and so we're focusing on broad questions within the areas of increasing access to safe drinking water, increasing access to sanitation and the practice of key hygiene behaviors uh, and improving management of water resources. And so uh, today's session is really intended to stimulate collaboration uh, and we've designed an interactive session uh, to that effect. Uh, but really long term, we want to continue to engage with you. The spirit of bringing everybody together is to make sure again that this is not just uh, evidence that we're producing uh, that will sit in PDFs on uh, USAID's website, but that we interact with the sector overall uh, so we can all make best use of our scarce foreign assistance uh, dollars in WASH. 
So for our part, uh, we're planning to invest uh, up to 65 million, uh, subject to the availability of funds and annual appropriations, uh, 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 in answering a subset of questions uh, through three dedicated implementation research activities that we're funding out of headquarters. And I'll just speak really quickly uh, to the broad strokes of these three, but you'll hear uh, through this session uh, from these projects directly. Um, so we've worked to carefully design these three to work in tandem together uh, and to execute field research activities and ensure, again, that uh, learning translates into action. So the first is uh, Wash Pals 2, which is a follow-on to the original Water Sanitation and Hygiene Partnerships for Learning and Sustainability activity uh, that many of you know, which was implemented from 2016 to 2021. So in addition to hearing about the updated scope of that project, which now includes attention to the fecal sludge value chain, uh, in addition to focus on area-wide sanitation uh, implementation modalities, which we've certainly all been talking a lot about, um, uh, the scope also includes extensive research on menstrual hygiene and health. Uh, and you'll hear about how the results of Wash Powell's one's extensive research, research partnerships, uh, including with UNICEF uh, across multiple countries, is influencing how we want to partner um, not only with Wash Powell's two, uh, but with these other activities. You'll also be hearing about Urban Wash, uh, which is a research project focused on both wash and water resources management in cities and peri-urban areas, with a focus on enabling environment factors for accelerating uh, urban water and sanitation service delivery, improving the performance and sustainability of small and informal providers, and measures for source water protection and diversification, uh, which is all the more critical uh, in the face of climate change. Uh, and then finally, you'll hear about real water. Uh, some of you may have already heard uh, literally about it through our podcast uh, on that. Um, uh, but this is our research focused on rural services, uh, and real water's three priority research areas are focused on increasing drinking water safety and monitoring, producing a clear understanding of how to professionalize rural water service delivery uh, to elevate facility performance, and how to incorporate water resources management again into the planning and execution of rural water supply programs. So, you know, again, uh, we really feel that it's our role uh, from a headquarters standpoint to make sure um, that we are investing resources to make sure that some of these higher calls to action that we've all been talking about the past couple of years, area-wide sanitation, professionalized water, rural water service delivery, uh, that we put a finer point on how to do this in specific contexts. Uh, and we're really uh, eager to partner with all of you um, as we close in on the, the 2030 date uh, and the need to really accelerate the pace of change to achieve SDG 6. So, just in closing, really, really grateful for your participation. Looking forward to the interactive session to, to come. Um, and really looking forward to deepening our collaboration on this research agenda, not just today, um, but throughout the implementation of these three projects. So big thank you, and I'll turn it back over to, to Rachel. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, it's really exciting to see USAID prioritizing evidence-driven programming. And we're, we're just really happy to be here for this session and, and see this movement more generally in the sector. So thanks. Um, next up, I realized I actually forgot to introduce myself. I'm Rachel Pellets, the Executive Director of the Quiet Institute. Um, but next up, I'd like to introduce Caroline van der Vuden, who is with um, Wash Pals 2. So she's the deputy chief of party for Wash Pals 2. And she's going to be talking us through an example of a research partnership, which was um, under Wash Pals 1. So thanks, Caroline. Thanks, Rachel. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you all for coming. And yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about Wash Pals, the first Wash Pals, to, to explain a bit how the model works. I wasn't part of the first Wash Pals, but I'm just talking you through what it looked like. There are some people in the room who were active members, including Rachel. Uh, so there are, if you have questions after, uh, there are people that can help you further. But really, uh, just points about the PDFs. Um, you know, the point of doing research differently is that what we want to do here is, is do the kind of research that directly informs the way programs are, are implemented. USAID programs, but also very much, you know, programs of, of partners and, and with partners to, to not end up with, you know, that many reports that aren't ever downloaded um, or, 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 or read. And also really 
um, just to, to make the point that this kind of research, what we're interested in here is not really, again, proving that watch is worthwhile. Um, you know, this research really did come from, from some of these trials that were done and that showed us that, um, you know, some research can actually lead to some controversy, but really what we should be focusing on is the kind of research that helps us to figure out what works. And so that's very much what, what all these programs are about and what Watch Bells 1 was also about. So the way it's designed, the way Washbells was designed, and you'll see some of this back in the, in the next presentations from the current structures, um, is that is very much focused on, on implementation research. So working with implementing programs in the field to layer on uh, a research uh, design that helps learn from the program as it's going on, um, but that is so, you know, solid and academic and, and, and well-structured. Um, so tailoring research with, with the institutional partners, but also very much with, with the local actors and, and co-learning, which is you know, a bit of a phrase, but the point that it's, this is not the kind of research that gets done by people that come in, do the research and take it back home, but this is the research that you do by learning, you, know, you really learn jointly. So it has to include frequent consultation, it has to include you know, pre and post workshops. Most of these researchers actually have an MOU in place with the local partners to, that really outlines uh, what the roles and responsibilities of the different partners in this research uh, and in that program are. Um, and, and do a lot of you know, one on one sharing, broad dissemination, but, um, but don't look at it as, as something that leads to a paper and uptake. It may have the paper too. It's still research, it's nice. But, but really it's about how it informs programming, which means there has to be a, 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 another level of engagement. And so that's why you know, the activity-wide engagement strategy is really important. And so each of the research uh, programs, but then also each of the research projects underneath that get done in the different countries have their own engagement strategy. So it really does focus on, uh, on understanding that a level of engagement that you need to get to uptake of the research and you know use of the of the findings of the research. So a few words on on some of the experiences from the first wash bells. Um, that there was uh, wash bells was was a very good program and I can say that because I wasn't directly on it. Uh, you know I think it, it did some really interesting research that definitely led to messages and and findings that were were taken up and, and informed uh, programs and, and policy directly, mainly at the local level in those countries where the programs were going on, but even also beyond that, uh, there was some uptake among the global partners as well. Um, but it, it, it's worth acknowledging that there was probably limited replication or spread by those that weren't directly engaged. So, you know, the, the circle of partners Wash Bells had were very involved and engaged and, and interested in taking up the learning, but beyond that, we may not have quite reached or the audiences and the, the people that, that we were hoping to reach. Um, there are many reasons, I can say COVID as well, you know, it's not, there are reasons, but it's, it's worth acknowledging and it's worth that it's something we try to do better in this, in this second round. Um, another thing to acknowledge is that, you know, learning is, is not a linear process and what we want to move away from is this narrative of, of uptake and dissemination and we will send you a paper tomorrow. What we want to get to is let's learn together uh, on how you can use this data. And that's very much how these programs are supposed to be structured. And the last one, you know, it takes time. It takes time to operationalize. It takes time for organizations to take learning that's come from one program experience and actually turn that into guidance or policy or strategy for that organization going, going forward. So um, there's also a, a lag time and that has to also be acknowledged. Um, so what we wanted to do now, before we go into presenting the three different mechanisms in a bit more detail, is to talk, uh, or, or not me, is to ask someone who's been involved as an implementing partner in the research with Wash Bells. Um, and so what we, what we wanted to focus on particularly is the relationship with UNICEF. Uh, Wash Bells worked with UNICEF on a couple of things. One of them was, was a, a field trial on targeted subsidies for sanitation in northern Ghana, but there was some other work done as well. Um, and so. What we wanted to do is, is ask, and if I'm allowed to just introduce <laughs> Anne Trainer, ask Anne Thomas, the, the senior Russian advisor from UNICEF, to say a few words on, on how this kind of relationship works from the implementing partner's point of view, in this case, UNICEF. So Anne, over to you, thanks. Thanks very much, and I also, um, I wasn't part of Wash Pals 1, but this is 
um, you know, the, the insights I got from one of our country offices and one of my team members who served on the board of Wash Pals. Um, so I think, first of all, I think there was just a strong collaboration that spanned globally, you know, across some of the, the topics of interest in the research of Wash Pals, but also, you know, that, that went deep in some of the countries. And um, the specific insight was from Ghana, uh, where our country team was, was grappling with this issue of subsidies, and it was becoming quite polarized uh, within CLTS, and, and they really wanted to know how best to, to time the subsidies and, and where best to, how best to target communities uh, for the subsidies. Um, but it went much further than that, actually looking at sort of a comparison of different household financing schemes across the country, uh, which even today is actually having relevance for, you know, this, this plan to scale up uh, a new program. So I think the, the, the experience was very positive, and I think, you know, being able to have that kind of timely, real-time research that's responsive to a country's, you know, current need was, was good. And I, from what I understand, it, was, it happened very sort of quickly and dynamically um, and responsively. So I think that was good. And I think really going forward, you know, it's how we interplay the country needs and research with rollout of similar approaches in other countries and you know I think there was a suggestion here from the global team that maybe we we can do more in terms of spreading the the learnings across to other countries because some of the insights were really good and it would be good to share that more broadly um, yeah and I think in the context of the new program and UNICEF's new game plan you know I think there's a lot of opportunities for further research um, that we could explore so I think that's it from us Thank you, Anne, and, and thanks, Caroline. Oh, round of applause. Sounded like people wanted to give one there. So. <laughs> great. Mm -hmm. Thank, thanks so much. It's really great to hear an example of how research was integrated into an implementing program with UNICEF in, in Ghana on subsidies for sanitation. So thanks. Um, so next up, now we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about the three mechanisms that, that Jeff introduced to us briefly, but we're going to hear a little bit more about each of those, um, starting with real water. So I'm going, oh, here we go. Here's the, the three mechanisms. So real water and then urban wash and wash piles too. So I'm going to start with um, passing the mic to Vanessa Gunther from the Quiet Institute on real water. Thanks. Thank you, Rachel. Hi everyone, good to see you. Um, as Rachel mentioned, my name is Vanessa and I'm here to introduce Real Water to you. It stands for Rural Evidence and Learning for Water. We're actually very proud of the acronym, you know, it's very catchy and we try to keep it real as our uh, podcast says. Um, so real quick, our definition for rural is a bit flexible, but we tend to think of it as anything outside of urban centers, um, often agrarian villages or low density communities. So real water is funded through an $18.9 million cooperative agreement and will run over five years um, till 2026. And as a implementation research program, our goal is to develop and evaluate strat strategies for expanding access to safe, equitable, equitable, sustainable, and rural water services, especially in low to middle income countries. And this map shows um, some of the countries we are currently focusing our research in. So there's Ghana, Tanzania, Uganda, Kenya, and India. India. So these are confirmed research locations, and we're also, depending on how our research question, uh, questions develop, we're also looking at other countries and uh, evaluating other sites. So how are we gonna get to our goal? So we have a great consortium I wanna introduce. So I'm with the Aquia Institute, which is a applied research organization, and we're also the lead uh, grantee for Real Water and they're responsible for the program's activities on water testing and water safety. Um, our consortium includes AquaConsult, which has a long history of analyzing rural water management models. Hi, Harold. <laughs> uh, the Ashoka Trust for Research and Ecology in the Environment, based in Bangalore in India, which is our lead on water resource teleconnections with rural water supply. We also have Veena here today. 
um, the Rural Water Supply Network, Hi Sean, which provides knowledge sharing and connections among thousands of members. And we're also pleased um, to work with the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Ghana as a key research partner, uh, as well as two implementers of rural water programs in Africa, Safe Water Network and uh, Water Mission. So all of us are working together to focus on three important interrelated aspects of rural water supply development. And the first one is to improve management performance of rural water services. So rural, rural water supply occurs via a number of management modalities from public utility provisions to delegated private sector responsibility to community-based management. So real water is seeking to better understand what factors are instrumental in the system performance. The second one is improving planning for water resources. So real water is exploring the requirements for fo uh, successfully implementing holistic water resource management, specifically in the context of climate induced scarcity and um, extreme uh, weather events. And lastly, we have uh, water quality testing and in turn water safety. Um, so real water wants to gain insight into the implementation models and associated factors that will improve routine water quality monitoring and water, mo uh, water safety management. And I want to spend a little time talking about an example of this last topic um, that real water is evaluating called the Water Quality Assurance Fund. So briefly, the fund is a safeguard um, to encourage water quality laboratories to provide water quality testing services to water systems in rural areas, areas that lack capacity. So I will show the short video, well it's four minutes. Um, I tried to do it in voiceover for this, but it didn't make the cut, so you'll have to read along a little bit. The issue is not just saving water, but water that is safe and good for consumption. Under the testing program, the systems do pay some money to Ghana water from the lake. And of course, we are getting the extra revenue from that, so it's of great interest to us.
Professionalizing water quality testing has been the entry point for a series of changes in the district. To start with, water is now being treated. Stakeholders and customers are now demanding for uh, water testing better services. Another area is also the improvement in the relationship between the customers and then the water operators. Because customers now are now happy with the services that is being rendered. So um, under Real Water, we're actually doing a rigorous um, evaluation of this intervention. We're uh, specifically in Kenya and Ghana through a randomized control trial, and we're also piloting this uh, piloting this invention in um, Ghana and uh, in Uganda and Tanzania. And then lastly, um, I'm sure now you're all interested in Real Water and want to stay in touch. So I want to highlight our plethora of communication channels. Um, we have our website on Global Waters, um, which has our newest PDFs <laughs> and outputs, uh, but also a lot of other more interactive options like um, the podcast, which Jeff mentioned. Um, there's new episodes around every six weeks, and it's a new medium for us, so it's very exciting. So any feedback is appreciative. And I got to meet some fans out in these hallways already, so that's encouraging to see. Um, if you prefer reading rather than listening, every uh, p uh, podcast is accompanied with a blog post that also includes the main points. And then you can join our newsletter on Global Waters or our WSN's newsletter also has a section on real water. And then, as always, you can follow any of the consortium members on social media. So that's the little plug to stay in touch. And yeah, thank you for listening. I will pass it on to Urban Wash. Did you want to do an intro? Yeah. Great. Thanks, everybody. We're going to try to do a quick computer switch here. Um, so as we're doing that, I'm going to actually just maybe ask for one question for Vanessa during this. Oh, I have both mics, I realize, during this switch over. Or it can also be through the other presentations earlier. I really enjoyed the presentation. That's awesome work. Uh, my name is John. I'm an engineer from MIT. Uh, so I don't really have a lot of the you know business or like social sciences background, but it's really cool to see through this conference. Um, I was wondering uh, basically what sort of incentivizes users to pay for water in this structure. Can you elaborate a little bit more on like how that how that works? Sorry, I'll pass this back. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one on, on behalf of, of Real Water. So in this structure, it's actually not users that are paying specifically. I mean, they're, they're paying through tariffs, but then it's an agreement between the water, the, the district government who's responsible for managing the water systems and the lab that's doing the testing and then the assurance fund that Aquia is leading. So yeah, thanks. Great, so I think now here we are set up. So I will introduce our next speaker, Ruhi Abdullah. So thank you so much. And she'll, she's, the, um, she's with Urban Wash. She's the chief of party for Urban Wash. So thanks. Thanks a lot, Ruchi. <coughs> so thank you, everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all those present in the room and as well as those joining us virtually. Um, as ben uh, Rachel mentioned, my name is Ruhi Abdullah, and I'm the uh, chief of party for the Urban Wash uh, project. Uh, so let's get started. The, the urban resilience by building and applying new evidence in WASH, short form Urban Wash, um, is a US funded global five year research and learning project. Uh, its goal is to promote impactful sustainable, equitable, and climate resilient WASH and WRM programming. 
It will target uh, urban and peri-urban areas. It will strengthen evidence-based decision-making of partners and host governments at the local, regional, state, and national levels. Uh, the project is implemented uh, by Tetra Tech in collaboration with consortium partners, including Acquire Institute, which is Rachel and uh, the other people here, um, FSG, uh, represented by Rishi here at the back, uh, Iris Group, Segura Consulting, SCI, and Water Aid. So, uh, the project is basically, it comprises of, uh, to achieve, achieve this objective, the Urban Wash project will perform tasks and uh, uh, accomplish deliverables under the following three interrelated components. Uh, but our plan is a circuit in, in a circuitous co continuum. Uh, and that's very integral to this because one kind of leads to the other. So it's, uh, uh, there's a learning ongoing throughout the project life. So component one focuses on strategic engagements and partnerships. Component two focuses on uh, implementation research to generate high quality evidence. Uh, and component three focuses on short term on demand US aid technical assistance. So just taking a little bit of a deeper dive in under component one. Uh, I want you to think about this across three tiers. Uh, the first one being the anchor, which is develop, uh, which is based on engagement and for the project. The second tier is the thought leadership, uh, which is based on uh, the advisory board, uh, partners and collaboration, uh, research working group, and technical advisors and WASH experts. And the last year is uh, dissemination and uptake, uh, which is uh, to facilitate uptake and uh, develop research and learning project. And uh, now thinking back what uh, Caroline initially said, this kind of I is building up and you can connect the dots back here. So this is, I mean, it, it, this seems a little overwhelming, but I'm not going, we're not going to sort of delve m more in detail, but I just want you to, uh, just want to lay this out there that we cannot achieve our outcomes, long term and short terms, without effective engagement and strategic partnership, which is at the core here, research producers, knowledge brokers, and users. Uh, we have been purposeful and engaging in engaging local and global partners early. Uh, this is particularly critical to de design and implement, to implement demand-driven demand research. We re recognize that engagement is complex and will remain dynamic, continuously adapting to the changing context. Once again, engagement is a non-linear and interconnected process where some activities can happen simultaneously and provide feedback for iterating approaches and anticipated outputs and outcomes. Urban Wash will monitor and adapt its methods of engagement over the project life cycle. This will ensure continual improvement of our engagement and communication strategies so that efforts remain relevant to any changes in the context to outcome and are responsive, adaptable, and actionable. So component two is basically the implementation research piece. Uh, it comprises of three focus areas. The first one focuses on the enabling environment for improve access to quality water and citywide sanitation. Focus area two focuses on approaches for sustainable small and informal service provision. And focus area three focuses on measures to improve source water protection and diversification, and this is where the nexus of WRM and water supply lies. So uh, just a little bit of a deeper dive in terms of the focus area, because the focus area sort of lays out the questions and takes a deeper dive. But uh, I won't go in too much detail here because there's a lot of text on the, on the slide. 
But focus area one, which is focused on enabling environment, the focus here is mostly on policies, regulation, and institutional arrangements, uh, water safety, and pro-poor subsidies. Uh, the focus area two, uh, which focuses on small-scale informal providers, uh, the focus is on uh, policy, legal, and regulatory, and capacity building frameworks, scalable, inclusive market models to allow for viable participation of SIPs in citywide inclusive sanitary wash systems, and cost of compliance for formalization. Focus area three, uh, uh, which focuses on uh, uh, um, water resource management and at the nexus of water, water, water supply system is basically effective collaboration and coordination across agencies for resilient water supply, water, water source protection, uh, effective use and uptake of decision support and mob mobilizing financial resources and investment. And like I mentioned, I, these are, there, there are two tweaks happening as we are going along. So. Uh, Quickly, uh, so at this point in time, uh, on the different focus areas, we need partners for implementation, research activities on different topics noted. Uh, focus area one, uh, we are, we've currently drafted a memorandum of understanding in place with GWCL and Nairobi for implementation research activities on the, on the topics noted. Uh, we're exploring potential partners under focus area two. We put, we're exploring potential partnerships in Asia and Africa for implementation research on scaling equitable FSM models and viable tariffs for water small local providers. Uh, under focus area three, we're exploring partnership potentially with city uh, water authorities in low resource setting to effectively assess vulnerabilities, develop and implementation, implement solutions, including source water protection and diversification, sustainable governance and funding models for resilient water supply in low uh, resource settings. So under component three, uh, Basically, uh, th th this is based on buy-ins that uh, come in as uh, as needed from the U.S. Uh, missions, and the, the the core buckets here are implementation research, assessment and analytics, and M and E. So, so this is a map that actually kind of lays out where Open Wash is operating right now. Uh, we are op we have. Uh, we are basically doing implementation research and test research in, at, in around 20 countries, uh, which includes case study research in 16 countries uh, and implementation research in nine countries ongoing and planned. Uh, what we are seeking is uh, global, national, and local engagement partners for implementation research as well as dissemination and uptake on our, on our findings. Uh, so this is are asked basically uh, and, uh, and hopefully this, this platform provides us that opportunity. Um, so thank you. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any additional questions or are any of the, con uh, if you're working in any of the countries that we are currently working and exploring for any partnership possibilities. Thank you everybody. Great, Thank thanks. Thanks, Ruhi. It's really exciting to see this work on um, enabling environments and asking some of the key questions around regulations and policies, you know, small and informal providers, and also source water protection. So as we're doing this quick changeover, I will ask maybe for, for one question from the audience for Ruhi. I mean, I really love this whole concept of the co-learning, and obviously that's a tremendous benefit for the, the research partners, but these issues, we're all wrestling with them every single day. Is there a way to kind of have a co-learning process for the sector? So as these findings are kind of, as the evidence is building, you know, the rest of us can also make sure that we're, we're being able to tap in and take advantage of it as well before a report comes out. 
So uh, it, this is a very iterative cycle, and you're absolutely right. I mean, we've uh, over the decades we've looked at different modalities: what has worked, what hasn't worked. This is a new. This is sort of a, a modality that we are sort of also experimenting with as we go along, right? So uh, the research working groups that we're having, we will be publishing blogs on it. We'll be pu publishing some so short notes that could be sort of act as a sort of espouse some discussion and 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 sort of open the door for discussion. So that that is something on the radar. And that's something that we will be engaging in. Uh, but, but the thing is that code design, we, we are, right now we, we are starting implementation research, so we are testing uh, how the code design will roll out with, with uh, country working groups and then uh, how, how do we engage to actually get the, the, the code design mechanism working. So that's in the works, but you will be hearing on that soon, hopefully before the end of the year. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ruhi and Barbara. Um, so next up, we have Caroline, who you've already heard from, but here now she'll be talking about WashPals 2. Hello again. So thanks very much. And yes, uh, WashPals 2 is, is structured very similarly to to the structures to the the, the two projects that I've already presented. Uh, it's a it's a roughly 25 million dollar program of which about 10 million is for technical assistance the same type of technical assistance that that Rui described uh, to to missions to implementing partners and also a small grant window which will allow us to do some to to provide grants to uh, organizations to do smaller research uh, research projects that complement the the big research that's going on uh, with the partners uh, involved here. So the goal of, of Washpels 2 is very much to support learning and improvements uh, around challenges to ensuring quality, equity, sustainability, and scale of sanitation products and services, um, as well as adoption of sound hygiene practices. And there is a focus particularly on, on rural areas. Um, Washpels 2 is led by Tetra Tech uh, with the, with some of the same partners you've already heard from before, FSG, uh, Rishi's in the back, uh, Iris Group uh, working on, on Jesse issues, um, FHI 360, no, not sure one's in the room, <laughs> and uh, an ID Insight uh, taking, on, taking on some of the different themes. Um, the focus regions are, are particularly Sub-Saharan Africa and, and South Southeast Asia, uh, and focusing on, on the USA uh, water focused countries mainly. Um, as per, per the, pr the, the previous presentation by Rui as well, you know, building that partnership and, and making sure there is a lot of strategic thought leadership from across different partners is really important. So we've, we've got various structures to help us with that. The implementing partners, obviously, and, and like Rui was saying just now, all the research projects will be very much co-designed with those implementing partners. Um, then there's also an advisory board, which has uh, representation from those, uh, those those organizations on the side there, as well as an internal research working group and, and different technical advisors and, and experts. And that is really a mix of people with an academic background to make sure that you know the research we're doing does have the, the quality it needs to have, but also people with a, with a practitioner and programming background to make sure that it's the kind of research that, that is relevant for them. We are building on, on the first WashPals, and I would say one of the key takeaways from WashPals, the five years of research that were done there, is really that, that sanitation, sanitation interventions cannot function independently. That there is a space for work on behavior change and on demand creation, that there is a very important need to build markets, um, but also that, uh, that there are very many vulnerable people that have, ex that have trouble accessing that market. Uh, and that under under a, a traditional CLCS approach, if you like, would end up uh, with with facilities that just aren't durable, that aren't of sufficient quality, and so that there is space to to bring a subsidy element back in for those very vulnerable and poor customers um, that that couldn't afford access to sanitation otherwise. But how those three work together is very much a question that Washpels Two is picking up on. And. Uh, like Jeff mentioned, the overarching umbrella theme for Washpels 2 is area-wide sanitation. So how to do sanitation planning and programming for an entire district, commune, county, whatever it may be, for an entire administrative area. Um, planning for that entire area, obviously programming would be phased. Um, it's unrealistic to think that you could reach an entire area, but at least to, to plan for covering that entire area 
takes, uh, takes into account the fact that different approaches and different interventions will probably be needed for different parts of that area and for different population groups within, within that area. Um, so area-wide sanitation in a, nuts, in a nutshell seeks universal, sustainable area-wide sanitation and hygiene service delivery uh, at scale with a focus on safely managed sanitation and hygiene. And that is important because that is probably also a bit of a progression. So, uh, wash pals too. Uh, wash pals spends a fair amount of time trying to understand CLTS and the focus on ODF. Wash pals too is very much looking at the safely managed sanitation chain as a whole. And so the, the key principles for that really are scale, universal coverage and, and local slash national government leadership. Under that umbrella, we have three research themes or three research focus areas. Uh, the first one is area-wide sanitation itself. There's a lot to learn still. It is a relatively new concept uh, in that even though there's been a fair amount of experience in doing area-wide CLTS or ODF tar programming, there isn't that much experience yet on, on how to be set up to, to deliver on area-wide safely managed or at least even area-wide basic sanitation. Um, so there is learning to be done on the theme itself, uh, on, on the implementation of area-wide sanitation, but even on the core components and the operational framework of how to make area-wide sanitation work and what, what, what's involved there. And so themes we we'll, we'll, we expect to be, be delving deeper into through the implementation research include the role of monitoring and evaluation and learning and, and adaptive management. We see that as a really key component, a uh, key building block, if you like, of doing area-wide sanitation well, but there is a lot to learn on, for example, how, what does, what does government-led, local government-led m and &E and adaptive management look like in a way that is scalable and, and sustainable and feasible. Um, another theme here is, is on fecal sludge management and slash or uh, safely managed sanitation services in a rural context. Uh, acknowledging that, that FSM isn't always applicable depending on how, how rural you are and, and what kind of sanitation systems are in place. But focusing on, on um, what is required to, to make sure households construct and, and, uh, and maintain toilets that are safely managed along the, along the, the lifespan. And then the last theme here is really on, on gender equity and social inclusion. And under that, we will pick up on the work done on, on subsidy research that was already done uh, under Washbells one, but then really focusing on what I was saying earlier, that that integration of these three elements, subsidies, behavior, CLTS if you like, and markets, and how those three can work together most effectively uh, and when with most value for money, given that what we're after here is scale uh, and, and government leadership. But also looking at, at other gender equality and in social inclusion approaches that aren't about money per se, um, but that are about you know injecting a Jesse lens on all the work that gets done. The second focus area, the second theme is, is market-based sanitation. That was already a, a, a core theme of interest under Washpels and, and is very much building on that, but again with that lens of area-wide sanitation. And so uh, one of the areas of, of investigation there will be about optimizing enterprise engagement and, and expanding markets you know, within that district, within that area, to see how, how markets can, can target or can service a larger share of the population within an area by uh, either working on the product systems and making the product systems more, uh, more appropriate, more affordable, more transportable out there to, uh, to, uh, to people that may live a bit further away from the towns or from the current market catchment areas, as well as looking at channel financing, uh, for example, uh, helping enterprises to then be able to extend credits or extend better, longer credits to their customers. Another uh, piece of work here is on decision support tools, and this very much builds on, on Washbells, and this is about providing uh, or doing modeling on possible policies and, and uh, policies and strategies that sort of take place in the, business in the larger business environment, but that can have a real positive impact on the strength of the markets. Um, and lastly, there is a focus on, on understanding what viable rural FSM business models might look like. And I'm saying viable here on the understanding that that might not mean a business that can run itself <laughs> without any kind of uh, government or, or other, other support. But that is part of what we're investigating. And then lastly, uh, social behavior change and, and hygienic environments um, that's led by FHI 360. And there we expect to look uh, 
on the one hand, at, at uh, a strong focus on, on infants and young children and, and interventions that need to be put in place to break that chain of infection for infants and young children. And so focusing strongly on the caregiver behaviors, um, but also on animal feces management and other interventions to, to, in, to clean up the, the environment, to have a more hygienic environment for the infants and young children, as well as interventions that look at the uh, the, the nexus, I would almost say, because that's such a popular word this week, the, the, the link between hand hygiene and food hygiene, um, specific again to, to infants and young children. So that's roughly the, what the research will be looking at. But one other piece of work that is ongoing under, under Washpels 2 is we are undertaking a sanitation and hygiene workforce capacity needs assessment that will inform a roadmap um, I won't go into much detail. I'm very happy to talk to you about any of you about this afterwards. It, it's underway. Uh, we have done a, a sort of a global, if you like, overview. Uh, the purpose is really is to understand the, the human resources capacity, the human resources required to deliver universal access to safely managed sanitation and hygiene services. Again, with a focus on rural because there is much less knowledge on what human resources requirement for rural sanitation. Uh, what they are, what they look like, what kind of functions are needed, what kind of skills are needed, and who would be employing the people with those skills, what are the different institutions. Um, so it does have a focus again on sort of the human resources requirements to deliver on-site sanitation systems sustainably um, with that roadmap in mind. There are, for this project, there are uh, case studies on, ongoing in six countries, uh, Rwanda, Ghana, and Nigeria, and Nepal, India, and the Philippines. And then lastly, I just wanted to, to make a point that, you know, yes, we are still seeking partners. We don't have uh, the implementation countries all, all, all outlined yet. Uh, so we're still very much in those discussions. But we also seek partners uh, to, to continue our, our learning on area-wide sanitation, even beyond those direct implementation research pieces we will be doing, uh, to share reflections, learning, and, and, and data in a facilitated process to inform the core components and the operational framework of what successful area-wide sanitation actually is. Uh, we will be publishing, we hope to publish uh, a preliminary desk review report uh, shortly, which lays out our current understanding and our current thinking on what the operational framework for area-wide sanitation might be, but really with the idea that the next five years of, of research will inform that and we may very well come up with, a, with an updated version of that, of that understanding in a few years' time. And we are very keen to collaborate, you know, for, for more systematic documentation because <laughs> uh, even now in this first phase of, of trying to do desk review on area-wide sanitation, it is, <laughs> it is new rural sanitation is a bit neglected. It's been mentioned quite a few times this week. Uh, and there is also much less documented evidence on it that's available. So documentation is important um, and we're very keen to, to work on that with, with partners as well. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Back to Rachel. Um, great. Thank you so much, Caroline. It's great to hear about area-wide sanitation, market-based approaches, and social behavior change and how that research is really going to move this sector. So I think we'll just take one question. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. This is fantastic um, and really uh, exciting to see the sort of work that's already begun and I love the assurance fund, by the way. Uh, so I just had, uh, my name is Deepa Karthikeyan. I'm uh, from Athena Infonomics. I, I love this sort of focus that all of you brought out on the need for shift in language from uptake and dissemination to use. I wonder if there's an effort among the three programs to come together and think of a harmonized set of indicators of what, that, what success looks like on use and language that will get used consistently and Sort of a follow on to that is, so we're leading a learning platform on citywide inclusive sanitation supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And we, this is something we struggle with. I feel like when you kind of unpack words like co-learning, co-production of evidence, there's so much that needs to be said about the process of how that's done well. And I wonder if that'll get covered in, for example, the next podcast, or if there's an emphasis on also talking about the how of the co-learning and where you failed and where you've succeeded. Thanks. Well, yeah, just to say that, yes, we, <laughs> we have been discussing it. We've already even had a, uh, a Global Waters facilitated discussion about it a while back, um, which includes, 
you know, sharing sharing info between us on, on the best type of indicators and ways of monitoring this, but also some of the pitfalls and things to be looking out for. So yeah, it's yes, it's it's on our minds and we hope to be able to share some of that learning on the learning. <laughs> yeah, as well. It's a great question. Maybe just a quick response from um, have overall USAID perspective. Um, we view this as um, critical implementation research across uh, these three activities. Um, but we do have a broader framework for um, collaborating, learning, and adapting over time from uh, an agency-wide perspective. So you may be familiar with many of the technical briefs that we've put out um, that synthesize the most recent evidence. And one conversation that we're having as a team is based on all of the results of this, how can we present all of this as a common package uh, externally too? So we are still working on that internally, um, but certainly that evolution of having had this series of tech briefs with these investments now, um, we're thinking about that both internally to influence our own field staff, but then similarly externally, sector-wide, to make sure that this is all presented in a coherent, uh, digestible format across all of these. In the interest of time, we're going to move to the next phase, which is breakout groups, and because we want to hear from all of you. I know this was somewhat high level, and it'll be great to dig into some of the details. Um, so we're going to not have group number five, um, and we're going to have four groups here in the room in the four corners, and then we're going to have one online. So for those of you that are online, please um, look at the polls, and in the chat, there'll be questions for you to participate in. So in this corner over here, we're going to have on area-wide sanitation, and Caroline is going to be facilitating that one. In this corner here, we're going to have Ruhi on urban wash services for the poor. And then in this corner back here, we're going to have Vina from Atri, who's going to be leading on linking wash, water resources, and climate resilience. And then in the far corner there, we're going to have Rishi, hi Rishi, um, from FSG, leading on incentivizing service providers or private sector engagement. Um, so we have almost half an hour, 25 minutes or so, um, and we're also gonna have Harold Lockwood from Agua Consult is gonna be rotating around. Um, you are welcome to rotate around yourselves if you want as well, or you can stick with one group the whole time. So, all right, thank you everybody. Please don't leave too, thanks.
Carol Lockwood from Agua Consult just to give a couple thoughts before we do do our closing. So, um, thanks very much, uh, <coughs> Rachel. Just I went very briefly around the group, so it's very it's pretty time uh, time limited exercise. But I think um, there were some probably some predictable discussions around uh, using evidence, packaging it in an in a appropriate way to reach your audiences. But two things that I think jumped out at me and struck me were around, one, the word and the concept of local, so locally led evidence about talking to and engaging with your intended audiences from the very beginning. So don't, you know, do all this evidence gathering, generate uh, evidence and produce lots of uh, papers and then go and find your audience and like look uh, a hammer to look, what is it saying? Uh, build a nail and then look for a hammer to hit it with. Um, and then the second issue or theme that came out very briefly in these discussions was around scale. So two, at least two of the groups talked about the scale of partnerships. So if we generate this evidence, how do we really get it to, to impact? And the only way you can do that really is working. So there was a mention about health workers delivering messages and from, from the table there that Vina was running and around um, engaging with local government, associations of local government in Bangladesh here in this group. So two things that are local and then scale and how that, those two things, those themes apply to, to really delivering the evidence. We know we can produce the evidence, I think. It's how do you then use it effectively and these two things jumped out but it was a very, very quick exercise. So that's about it for now. Thanks. Thanks so much, Harold. And we're going to leave up the flip chart, too. We're not going to go through all the groups, but feel free to wander around afterwards and look at some of the key points. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Jeff Goldberg again to just give a, a quick closing for us. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, operative word being quick there. I know it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, late in the day. Um, but just to kind of reiterate um, what I mentioned at the, the top, uh, we're really, really excited uh, to be um, about a year into these uh, three activities and investments uh, beginning to work. But we don't want to do, be doing this in isolation. And the spirit of being here today uh, is really to let you know what we're all up to. Uh, as you heard, we have some uh, nascent partnerships formed uh, with uh, institutions across the sector. but. To the extent you think there are opportunities or you would like to get involved, really encourage you to, to reach out to everybody that you heard from uh, here today. Um, and we really don't want this just to be something that's disseminated uh, at the end, um, really moving beyond and committed to moving beyond uh, simply posting uh, reports uh, and things of that nature. And we want to learn together. Um, and we really think that this is imperative. Uh, we've talked a lot. Um, about the need to transform how we work. Uh, we know that there's certain kind of aspirations and um, buzzwords that we all use, um, but really kind of unpacking what that means uh, on a contextual basis across different geographies, I think is really critical to make sure that our investments uh, and the implementation modalities that everybody's working with uh, yield the results that we all want. So uh, big thanks for, for being here. Um, hope everybody's off to uh, a drink or dinner um, or just relaxing. Um, and yeah, thanks so much.